All righty. Welcome to Grace Christian Fellowship. Glad to have you here this morning. Hopefully everybody got a bulletin. And we just got a couple things I want to point out here. Uh, as always, our weekly prayer, uh, 7 to 8 here at the church. And uh, feel free to text me or send an email if you have prayer requests, as always. And uh, definitely more than invited to come. Then we have a couple of uh, upcoming events here right around the corner. Uh, first one is a uh, local church here, Inspired Church, is hosting the Women's Hand in Hand event. Uh, so that's on September 9th. Uh, over in Cedar Woolley, got a $25 cost to it. Uh, if you're interested in that, please see Karen Flicker. Raise your hand. If you, you're, you've been you've been named here, Karen. So all right. Or Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Always love that thing. What? <laughs> so there you go. So if you got any information on that, let us know. And then the men, we're going to have a men's mini retreat. On Saturday, September 16th, uh, being hosted by Faith Community Fellowship just up the college way up there. Uh, and there'll be about uh, four different speakers uh, presenting lessons from First Peter for the guys. And uh, breakfast and lunch is provided. We just need to know who's going to come. So if, if you want to come and just have a good morning, getting blessed by the guys, let me know. Uh, it says, ask Pastor Robbie for questions. There you go. So. Feel free to give me a holler, and uh, I'll probably send a text out, see who's going to come anyhow, so I'll look forward to that. Is there anything else going on that we need to be aware of? No? All righty then. Let's get ready to open God's Word, and we will pray. Father, I just... Uh, Thank you for this time now as we get ready to worship you in the word. Father, I pray that you would uh, open up our hearts, open up our minds. The scripture says, open up our eyes that we may be seen the glorious things from your law. But Father, I pray not only that you open up our minds and eyes, but Father, I pray that you give us hearts and souls that will soak it up. And that Lord, it will become part of our thinking. We'll think about what you have to say. And uh, uh, Lord, well, it'll change our hearts and lives. And we just ask that in your name. Amen. All righty. We're in Genesis chapter 19. We've been proceeding through Genesis there. Uh, we've hit a couple lessons, a couple different Sundays here, talking about you know, Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot moving into the city and worldliness and such. And. Uh, we've talked about the angels arriving in town and a lot convincing them to stay at his house. Uh, the men in town, he, of course, the men in town came to to do unmentionable things to the guys because they're like, well, uh, hey, you know, strangers and very, uh, they wanted to sexually brutalize them. Uh, stayed, and then God states to her, and even Lot says, knows that their actions are wicked. The lot is then going to attempt to, to negotiate the angel's safety, and he he offers his daughters to them. Which, as I had said, I imagine the daughters were like, Dad, that isn't cool. I can't believe you would do that. But this is the situation where he's at. As we proceed today, I wanted to keep in mind an age-old story. It actually comes from the, the, the Greek story, storyteller, Aesop. And I know many of you have heard it. It's about the, the young shepherd boy that is out in his field, and he, for grins, decides to shake things up a bit in town, and he decides to go running into town and say, the, the wolf is coming, the wolf is coming, it's going to eat my sheep. But there was no wolf. And of course, all the men of the, of the village go running out to go deal with the wolf. They get out there and there was no wolf. And the kid's like, ha, 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 you know, just, I was just kidding. There, there was no wolf. Uh, they, ha, ha, funny joke. Well, you know, down the line, he gets bored again. He does the same thing. He goes running down, the wolf, the wolf, the wolf's going to eat my sheep. And the, all the guys jump out and they go running to go get the wolf. And no wolf again. And the kid, ha, 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 this is so funny. This is a great joke. And, uh, of course, we all know. Finally, a wolf does come. 
and then the kid goes running into, into town. He's like, a wolf, a wolf is coming. And then, of course, all the guys are like, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. right? And of course, the whole thing was his credibility, his uh, being taken seriously. His warning is no longer meant anything because he, he wasn't the, a good shepherd. He wasn't a, a truthful shepherd. And so that's really part of our lesson today is we're really looking at, at Lot and his credibility, what he had there. And really also, there's other, as you, as we go through the story, just this part of it, you're going to see where other people don't take God's men seriously. And they, they pay for it. Uh, but that note of being taken seriously we need to stop and just ask ourselves that. Do people take us seriously? In our Christian walk, are we taken seriously? Do people like, oh yeah, that person right there, that brother, that sister, boy oh boy. They know God. Everything they say about Jesus and about the Bible is something to be taken seriously because I see their life, their choices, and what they're doing. That's a serious person. That's something we need to chew on this morning. So let's dive in. We're going to be at verse 9. Genesis 19, 9 in the first part of the verse. And so there we're at the door where the townspeople have been demanding to come in. And uh, they said to them, because Lot's out there, he's outside the door. He's standing there. He's like, come on, guys, stop doing this. And they say, and they said to him, stand back. And as they said that, they, and then they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Remember, it's like, hey guys, don't act so wickedly. Don't do this wicked thing. He says, now he's become the judge. Now we'll deal worse with you than with them. Well, that's not good. This does not spell a good time at all. So the men, you know, they, they became indignant about this. They're like, how dare this outsider come in and pass judgment upon their culture and on their values. And you may say, wow, culture of values, I don't know about that. But it was their culture and it was their values. That's where they were at. And of course, we're the outsiders. Always remember that. The moment we believed in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are now the outsiders. This, this place is not our home anymore. And so we are the outsiders. And so, yeah, we need to be prepared for that. People will... When we start to say things about our culture and our values as they are morphing around us in time here, uh, where people will get indignant with us. They will not like it. Well, how, who are you to judge something? You know, you're, you're, you're just a person. Nay, they, they don't even know our background. It's like, well, you did this and did that. How, how can you judge and say something? But we can. Even if you come from a very shady background you, we still have that power you can still say that is what I did who I was but I'm not that person or I don't support that anymore I mean you may even struggle with something that doesn't mean you can't say something you can even say hey I struggle with such and such a thing and I know it's wrong so I feel that I need to say something and that's okay people still may not like it they may come after you but it's still, we have to confront it. Because, you know, our culture and values, uh, even in America, has been changing over time. Of course, the world's been changing over time. It always does. That's the way that the march of mankind and sin and everything else just marching through, going towards the end of time. You know, it's just, it's always there. Uh, and, and it can be varied from culture to culture, time to time. You know, it swings back and forth, always like the pendulum, you know, from you know, more, uh, good moral values to poor moral values, as there it is. So uh, it's always a cocktail of either uh, goodness and virtue, the goodness and virtue, being virtuous, being true, like a, a noble person, or wickedness and degradation. So one person's goodness and value could be like somebody who's lovingly devoted to a pagan god. Now, that's a bad thing, because God says there is no other God, but we can meet somebody. We can meet somebody who just like, seems like the most awesome person, and, but they, 
They're not worshiping the true God. They're worshiping the pagan God. And a lot of people say, oh, well, who are we to talk about their values and their culture? How could we say anything? But we wish that the next part of that culture and values, because this very person in their loving care for a pagan God is willing to sacrifice an innocent human being to that pagan God. And then you're like, hey, whoa. And the reason we would say, hey, whoa, is because our Christian values, our Christian culture say God doesn't demand that person to be sacrificed. He is taking care of the sacrifice. Human beings are valuable. All our culture, all our values of Christianity start coming out. And we would, we would say, no, 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 that's bad. But in that culture, they would say, oh, no, this is the thing we do. Yay! And so, this is what's going on. And, and, and so, we have to always remember, culture and values should be respected. Let's face it. You know, the couple, three weeks ago, I went over to the, uh, to the, to the Scottish Fair down there, the Highland Games. It was fun. You know, I have a Scottish background, so it was fun. I'd never, ever been. So it's kind of cool to check it out, you know, see what they're, yeah. Of course, I've never done any of their games. I've never thrown telephone poles. I've never taken, <laughs> you know, uh, stacks of hay and tried to throw it as high as I can. We were watching that. That was pretty amazing. And sh sheep dogs and all sorts of stuff. And all the different cartons, all the clans going on. It was all interesting, you know. And, and you did get, the, there were some, some pagan guys there showing up, you know, uh, kind of idea. I just, like, left them alone. But, uh, but all of it, there's that culture. Is that the only culture? Like, you know, sometimes Scottish people say, yeah, you're Scottish. If you're not Scottish, you're crap. <laughs> but that, 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 that culture. Because somebody from anywhere else would say, no, our, our culture is the culture. And so we, in that sense, we could respect that. But we must always remember, as Locke was discovering, not every culture is equal. Not every culture is equal. There's things, there's elements within a culture that can be morally bad. Let's face it, I always think of the idea that Germans in World War II Germany felt very comfortable sending Jewish people to the camps. But everybody else in the world was saying, hey, just, well, just a second, what are you doing? They had moral questions about that. So yes, cultures should be respected, but they're not always equal. And that, Locke was just discovering that. So Lot apparently made the decision to start saying something about it because he's calling that, hey, your actions are wicked. He became their judge. The Holy Spirit actually, through Peter, has given some insight into what Lot was dealing with. And maybe some of us are dealing with this as we work in this world. Because he was, he was a, being, a, 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 even though he was dealing with this, his worldly soul had a problem. Peter talks about it in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, and he says, And if he rescued righteous Lot, notice he's calling Lot, Lot righteous. This is, the Holy Spirit sees him, and even though Lot, by position, was not being very good, but something was still there. The Holy Spirit was still working with him, and he says that he was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, uh, for as... For as that righteous man lived among them day by day after day, in verse 8, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he heard, uh, that he saw and heard. So here's Lot, it tells us this guy, he's seeing anything, but he's not saying anything. So much so that they even made him a leader. Remember, he's a leader at the gate. Not saying anything, and it, it's killing him. And most of us, there's probably been times in our lives where we're in a situation where we're just like, this is not good, not good, not good at all. And your heart, your mind, and everything else is going after you, feeling. You're like, this, this is a torture, hurting you. It says that he was distressed. His mind was then constantly disturbed. Gee, Lot, why you got the grumpy face? Oh, oh. I don't <laughs> want to tell you, man. I don't want to tell you. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> Grumpy face. Yeah. It says that, of course, what they were doing was sensual behavior. He was, he was deterred, disturbed by their sensual conduct. 
Now this isn't just, just sex that they're talking about. This is when you live for pleasure. When just feeling good and doing whatever you want is unrestrained, unfiltered life. When you were just like lewd behavior, speaking of anything, intimate things that inappropriately. So the, just a whole gamut of what's going on. So he was seeing it all. And it said that it was tormenting him. In the sense it was harassing his soul. You ever felt harassed sometimes where it's just like you just, it's just getting after you. It's just like, with, you know, unsourced, sometimes unbelievers do want to get us. They want to get our go, push our buttons, make us do something that would not represent Jesus well. And that's the same thing he was dealing with. It was actually, in a sense, inflicting pain upon his heart. It's like, this is just hurts seeing these things. That's why we have to have discernment. That's a big word, discernment, to understand, to see, uh, to, to pay attention to what's going on. Wisdom is also the word that's used sometimes. To have to be wise in this world. Uh, the first thing to have uh, discernment in the role of our lives is to let the word of God discern us. Maybe you have, probably know this verse, Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I, I love this verse. I love it because it tells me what the word of God is doing. It's discerning. It's looking. It's telling us. It's taking a look at like my thoughts, my intentions, to tell me the truth. And that allows us. But the thing is, is maybe you say, well, you know, I might have folks around me that don't believe the word of God. I may say a Bible verse and they don't believe it. Don't let that stop you. Because the word of God, if you put it out there, it'll do its work of discernment on them. They'll sit there and like, they'll know it. They'll be disturbed. They're like, hey, don't tell me that Bible verse. You know, why would they say that? Why would they care? Except that Bible verse is zooming in, zeroing in on their spiritual rebellion. And they're going after it. So yes, the word of God will do its work. Second, uh, in discernment, when we think about discernment, is how we discern comes when we grow in spiritual maturity. Growing, that, and that's, that's my call as a pastor. That's, that's my job, doing the Word of God. It's, 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 I'm supposed to uh, proclaim the Word of God, helping you grow in all wisdom and maturity. That's my job. That's what I'm doing. But maturity doesn't come from how long you listen to me. <laughs> Duration does not make it maturity. Just because I'm 58 years old does not mean I'm mature. It's Experience. It's putting things to practice. It's training. That's what does it. Getting trained up. I love Hebrews 5.14. It says, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have by have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. It takes practice. It takes getting in your word. It takes having conversations. It takes confrontation. When somebody's doing something and you're like, hey, what are you doing? And they'll say, oh, such and such a thing. And maybe they'll maybe even justify it. Well, you know, I feel like as, as a Christian that I can just go around and, and worship trees. So it's like, where do you get that? Where did that come from? And to be able to confront those things and answer it. Maybe, maybe you won't have an answer. I don't know a lot of people like, I don't want to have a conversation because I just don't have all the answers. Don't let that stop you. Ask questions. Find out, where, and then open up your word. Say, hey, Lord, that, that person just made a lot of assertions. A lot of things I didn't know. I want to ask questions, Lord. I want to figure out what's going on. And if you can't find the answer, say, hey, Pastor Robbie. Someone, so and so said something. I had a friend at work or a relative that said such and such a thing. I don't get it. Well, maybe I'll look at it now. Maybe I won't know the answer. But you know what? It's great about that. Well, I will go looking. I'll go looking. 
because I want to know. A doctor might, I may never ever see that person. I may, I may only see you. And you may never see that person, but you know what? What you'll find out is something about the Lord. Something that you'll know. Because see, when we don't know something, when that gets at it, it niggles at us. It gets in there like, meh, and it's, it'll, it'll become a source of doubt, source of questioning. And it's always good to go after it. Don't be passive about it. Go be active. Find answers, and they're there. Third thing on that is we need to understand that non-believers will be most often confused and offended by spiritual matters. They will. Uh, we just got to be ready for that. Some of the, I, I understand. This is the guy that doesn't want to offend people. I really don't. I, I don't want to do that. But I know that there's times I have to say what I have to say. I have to ask that uncomfortable question. Hey, you just said such a sentence. Such and such a thing. What did you mean by that? I gotta ask that. And that person may look at me cross-eyed, like I can't even believe you'd ask me that question. But I gotta ask it. And and that's be, because they, they don't understand. Because unbelievers, they don't have the Holy Spirit teach them truth. They need to know these things. And that's where part of us by talking to them, by conveying to them, by giving them a Bible verse, by telling them about Jesus, by hanging out with them, the Holy Spirit's going to be working on them, going to be doing things in their heart and life. Because it, like Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, he says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. In other words, they're foolishness. You start talking to people, some people about Jesus, and they're like, yeah, whatever, Jesus freak. What is that? <laughs> Leave me alone. Yeah, I'm a little bunch of spiritual mumbo jumbo stuff. That's what they're thinking. And it's understood because to them, that is exactly what it is. And it can be frustrating. It can be really frustrating for somebody who's trying to tell somebody the truth. But if you realize, hey, there's going to be some resistance here, there's going to be lack of knowledge. That it's okay. It's okay for them to feel that way. You can say, hey, I understand. You may think this is wild stuff. But let me tell you what Jesus did for me. I don't know anything much about Jesus, maybe. But I do know one thing. I was blind, but now I see. Your own personal testimony can say everything. Because it's hard to argue with that. And they won't be able to understand for them because it's spiritually discerned. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Because this last point really illustrates the next event. Because as these folks were hanging around Lot's door, they were really offended and they were fired up. The next part of verse 9, it says, Genesis 19, 9b, it says, And then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. So remember, just, remember Lot had to try to get these guys out of the public square. He's like, no, don't stay there. He was pressing them. He's like, get out. no, don't stay there. This is a bad place to stay. Get out of this. Come to my house. Come to my house. You want to not stay there. Come to my house. And so now, just as he was stubbornly doing that, these guys are now, no, we're getting in. We're getting in there. We're going to tear that door down. And that's how excited they were to get in there to go after these guys. Tearing the door off was an option. But now we come to spiritual blindness. Because thankfully, as you and I know, and I'm not sure if Lot knew, but we know, these guys were angels, and they had the ability to deal with the situation. It says in Genesis 19, verse 10, it says, But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. I just want to know right there. These guys, these angels are really hands-on. Because we're going to see where they're constantly having to drag Lot going. We're going to see next week. It's just like lots like of a guy who knows the place is going to get wiped out. He's like, oh, do I got to go? Really? <laughs> They're having to drag him out of town. So, yeah. So here they are. And so then these guys do something every bodyguard wishes they could do. It says in Genesis 19, 11, And they, the angels, struck with blindness, 
the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. So now you may be wondering, it's like, well, now were they totally blind? No. But they were, they were blinded by, by a confusion. So in other words, they were looking for the door. It's like a guy, when I'm looking in the fridge, trying to find the ketchup. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking, and I'm looking, and it, it's just like, it's not in there. Sarah will tell me from the living room, it's on the third shelf in the back. <laughs> oh, there it is. How did she know that? We're blinded. It's right in front of us. Of course, I always love folks that sit there saying, well, if it was a snake, it would have jumped out and bit you. If it was a snake, I would have saw it. <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> but it's just like, so they, they're blinding them. They're, they're, they're trying to find the entrance. And, and a good story that helps us show this, it actually, and I can't give the whole references, so I'll write it down. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the last half of the chapter tells the story about the prophet Elijah. Prophet Elijah kept telling the king of Israel at the time all the things that the, the king of Syria was about to do. King of Syria found out about it. He's like, who among you guys has given up all the good? Tell him the secrets. Who's doing that? And they're all like, no, nobody's doing it. And somebody piped up and it's like, not any of us. It's this guy in Israel named Elijah. Everything you say, even in your bedroom, gets told to him, and he passes along. He's like, well, that's it. We need to go find this guy. Where's he at? He's in the city called Dothan. He's there. Let's go get him. So he brings in his whole army to go get this guy. He's like, this guy's done. Shows up. It's a great, great episode of blindness. Because he shows up with this army, and his Elijah's servant comes out, and he's like, ah, army! This is not good. We only have a few of us. Army. <laughs> Elijah says, hey, God, open up his eyes. Show him what's really the case is. Opens up his eyes and he sees the whole host of heaven is there. So he, he didn't see something. That's something he didn't see. But then now, Elijah's like, okay, God, don't let them see either. And they didn't. But they, they still saw. So he goes out to them. And he's like, who are you looking for? Oh, we're looking for Elijah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, well, I'll tell you what, he's not here. This is where he's at. Follow me. He takes them deeper into Israel, right into where the king of Israel was at, draws them all in. Then he says, okay, Lord, open up their eyes. And they're like, so imagine that. You think you see something. You're going in a direction, and you, all you see is what the Lord tells you to see. They were seeing something going right along, and suddenly they were there. So much so that the king of Israel was like, hey, you want me to get him? I can get him. I'll take him out right now. It was wonderful. Elijah just said, no, just give him a lunch and send them on their way. <laughs> Which is what he did. And it's just, but there it is. They, they, like, and this is why when we have our friends or family that do not believe, and you get so frustrated, it's like, how is it? It's plain as day. We're like we're looking in the Bible. We're like Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God in the flesh. How come you can't see it? Well, we're gonna we'll see in a second what the problem is. Spiritual blindness, as I mentioned before. It's interesting how the Bible talks about this. One, it's like Isaiah talks about the blindness of those who choose to worship false gods. That they make themselves. That's, he has a whole description where a guy, he's making a fire, grabs a chunk of wood, and he says, I'm going to make a god. Chops up the wood, carves it out, puts the eyes on it, ears, nose, all those things. But God mocks him in that. He says, it, it can't do that. And it, 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 it's not going to hear you. It's in Isaiah 44, verse 18. It says, They, the God, this wooden block, does not, knows not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes and they cannot see. Oh, well, sorry, that's the guy that made it. So he's making this block. He thinks it's a God. He's like, Not so. And he's telling them about the, the people that would do that. He says, They don't know. They don't discern, for he shut their eyes. They cannot see. In their hearts, they cannot understand. That's why when, when we're witnessing, we really need to pray. We need to pray for God to open up their eyes. We need to pray that 
whatever Bible verse we share, whatever, is there a Christian song, is there something that we can do to share that God will open our eyes with? He'll reveal himself to them. And he'll, you know, that's one thing, but God said that the Holy Spirit would come to reveal his righteousness, reveal his holiness, and to show folks that their, their lack of righteousness and their sin. He would convict them of sin. So that's what we pray for. On Wednesday nights, we pray for our valley, that they would know that, that the, the unbelievers would understand that, that God's conviction would go out, and they would know. Now, in this instance where God is going after these guys in blindness, but there's also this blindness can sometimes be put on by the very enemy of God. Paul talks about this in his veiled gospel because he's like, we're giving out the word of God, but it, 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 you, we know this. You, you talk to somebody, it's just like, man, I talk, I talk, I talk. It's like they just don't see. And he says the gospel is veiled in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, and it says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light, the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Blinded them. That's why we have to pray, like just the, like amazing grace. It's just like I was once blind, but now I see. Pray for them. What it takes for them to see. I hope they see. Do you see something? How many fingers am I holding up? It's just like, you know, it's just, you know, it's just like we want them to see what is true, but they're blinded. So, these angels then graciously extend an offer of physical salvation for the incoming in judgment. Verse 12 of Genesis 19 says, Then the men, these angels, said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of this place. So here's this moment. Remember we previous chapter, Abram or Abraham interceded for the city. He's like, okay, Lord, is there 50? Will you save it? 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. He, he gets it right down. It's just like, will you? And God's like, well, yeah. So even if the minimal number, if they're 10, I'll save them. So here's Lot. Turn. It's like, Lot, do you know anybody here? Anybody you can get out of here? Bring them out of this place. And that's the thing. You know, God and Jesus saves us from the wrath of God. He can rescue us. That's, when I came to Christ, you better believe I knew I was a sinner. I knew I needed, I needed salvation. That was the primary thing on my mind. Absolutely. I wanted to, it's just like, I knew it. There was no, like, oh, gee, I wonder if I've sinned a little. I, I knew. <laughs> it's like, and I knew I needed a Savior. And he, he came in my heart, came into my life. I believed in what he did, and he saved me. And the Lord, as Peter says in 2, 2 Peter 2.9, he says, the Lord knows how to rescue. The Lord, you know that? He knows how to rescue that's a great thing. He rescues us. And it says that he rescues the godly from trials to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. So in other words, this, this, this whole idea is, guess what? The wicked that do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior will not get away with anything. I know a lot of people get frustrated. I've talked about that before. Man, so-and-so just got away with it. No, they did not. God knows. Now, maybe on this earth, they, they, they might even go to all the way till the day they die with a crime that they committed against somebody and nobody knew about it. Like I shared the other day, there's like 100,000 you know, cold case files out there that people have not solved. But believe me, when those people get to heaven, God will hold them accountable. There's no unrighteous not getting away. But the righteous, God's like, oh no, I, I got you taken care of too. The blood of my son has covered you, and, and that's made it good. And I know how to take care of you, even how to get you home. So he says, okay, you got to go find these guys. And then he tells them why. Because maybe lots by now, he's like, what do you mean? What are you talking about going to find people? What's happening here? What's going on? 
Genesis 19.13, it says, For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against this people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And the thing that caught my eye on this was the outcry against the people. This goes to what I was just talking about. The outcry against this people. You may say, well, who was, who was crying out? Well, maybe some of the victims of what was going on there. But is there a God? They don't know. They're in their pagan culture there. Is there, is there somebody that will take care of these unrighteous people? acts as this wickedness has maybe been perpetrated upon them. But besides that, there's also just a spiritual. Remember when, when Cain and Abel were there and, and uh, Cain killed Abel and buried him in the ground? God showed up and he says, hey Cain, where's your brother? I don't know. <laughs> he says, oh I know. Your, the blood of your brother's crying out from the ground. I hear it. It's crying out. The wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities were crying out to God. Do something. I love it. In you know, Revelation chapter 6, it says, By the altar of God, the, all the saints are there. They're saying, When, Lord, when are you going to come? When are you going to deal with this? And he will in his time. But that outcry, and that outcry literally, oh, just like, do you want to put it up? <laughs> Uh, verse the, the outcry there, don't just picture like, like light sobbing or crying. This is the word there is like shrieking. Ah! Real frustration. You know, I, I, when I've seen uh, stories of people that when the, like the, I said the cold case files, they're just wondering, will their loved one ever find justice? And you can see the frustration. And they're just like, our loved one was murdered. Are they ever going to find the person that did this? And you can see the anguish of their hearts and their and their souls, just like for justice. That's that outcry. Now we come to the last part of this. I call this the end times joke. Tongue in cheek here. Because then times it's not a joke. But we're going to see how this works out for the law. Because now he finds out, whoa, the whole town's going to get wiped out. This light's a fire under him. Time to cheek. He's ready to go. Who to fetch? So verse 14 of chapter 19 says, So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were going to marry his daughter. So here... This, just this comment of thinking about that. So here he is. This is how he's like giving his daughters to these worldly people. This guy whose whole life was being tortured by what was going on was still ready to just give up his kids to them, which is really very sad. And he says, he comes to them, to his sons in law, he says, Ah, get out of this place, but the Lord is about to destroy the city. But the, he seemed to his son's laws to be jesting. Just see, come on, man, the whole place is going to get wiped out. They're going to destroy it. Right. <laughs> oh, father in law, yeah. Because <laughs> remember, I, I've even thought about this. Because when it said all the men of the city went to that his house to go get him, that I think some of the sons in law were there too, looking for him. Maybe they were just part of the mob, like, hey, it's a flash mob, what's going on? Let's, let's have a party here, what's happening? But maybe they were there. So here it is. It just looks like a joke. Because Lot, I mean, Lot was living right among them. He hadn't said anything about what they were doing. And the, the whole place is going to be wiped out. God, God, who's this God you're talking about? I haven't heard you lot say anything about this at all. And you say it's going to come and wipe us out for how bad we are. You haven't said anything about how bad we are. So they're, they did not respect him. Can't be serious, lot. 
And this is going to be, I love that scripture comments, that this is going to be the state of the affairs that we will see. And yet, as the end times get closer and closer, whatever they are, 2 Peter talks about this, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 4, it says, knowing this first of all, primary knowledge, that's what it's say. first of all, this is something primarily we need to know, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. They will have contempt. They will deride the idea of Jesus ever coming back. Of course, it doesn't help when the cults are constantly telling everybody that, oh, well, yeah, he's been coming back. He's back. I didn't see it. My favorite one was Jehovah's Witnesses, who's like, first came back, like he said, oh, yeah, Jesus came back in like 1918. Then he came back in 1924. Then he came back in 1940 something. Then he came back in 1974. It's like, well, then that, what that does is it ruins the credibility. And it, of course, they wash it over in, in the cult there, kind of like mishmash it and everything else to try to pave the way for their false prophecy. Uh, but there it is. If the, everybody else is like, can see the writing on the walls. It's like, dude, you guys don't know anything. And that's the th thing here. He lost his credibility because he just wasn't even living it. He wasn't even telling anybody anything about Jesus coming back at all. Scoffing and contempt for it. So that made me wonder. I, I, I feel convicted about this a little bit myself. Is, is our practice of our end time theology a joke? In other words, you know, it's like, I know, I believe that Jesus could come back any day now. He could. Did I believe that 30 years ago? Yes. And it's still true. He could come back. But am I living that way? Am I thinking about that? And, and it kind of breaks my heart. I don't always think about it. I don't always process life through that lens, and I should. To be taken seriously. I mean, the approach. Apostle John, he said this in his little letter in 1 John 2.18, he talks about that we should all know this is the last hour. He says, children, it is the last hour. So you've heard the Antichrist is coming, and so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it's the last hour. You're like, well, Robbie, that's kind of silly, because he wrote that almost 1950-some years ago. How can it still be the last hour? Because it's looking at the whole time frame. This is the last hour. At a time, it's not taking a literal hour, it's the hour, the time. And this is the last time. We're, we are in the last day. We, we have been for 2,000 years. Jesus said so. This is it. But there it is. And we should warn people. Because we don't know. Could be tomorrow, could be next week, could be 10 years from now. But it's still true, and it's still Jesus is coming. And we all know the world's really getting better, isn't it? It's becoming so friendly to Christians, isn't it? So we know we're just like, at least by that attitude, it's not looking good. So could we be closer? I always love what my uh, previous pastor Leo said. Every day, we're one day closer. And that's the attitude we should have. And that should change how our character is. Are we seeking, are we acting in different in this world? Are we acting Seeking to have different godly character. Peter again talks to us in 2 Peter 3.11. says, since all these things, and he's talking about the day of the Lord, are thus to be dissolved. He's talking about all creation from the day of the Lord. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? In other words, in holiness, are we trying to be part of this world just like Lot? That's the whole thing. Lot just like, I'm in it. I'm in this town, I moved from the valley, moved into town, now I'm part of the leadership. No holiness. He was not separated from it. He looked, he looked like he was a sodomite, if you will. 
He looked like he belonged there. But he never said anything, never set himself apart. Godliness. That's our character. Not just being set apart, because he can sit there and say, you know, I'm not doing this, not doing that. Oh, I'm going to have your list of 5,000 things that you abstain from. But that doesn't make you godly. Remember, godly comes from those fruits of the Spirit. Are you loving? Are you kind? Are you gracious? Are you patient? Is that who you are? That's our godliness. That's walking in godliness. And that's what we should be doing every day. We should not only say, thank you, Lord, for this day, which I do all the time. I need to say, thank you, Lord, because this might be the last day. I don't know. I need to have that in my mind. I need to start putting that in there. I just don't think about it. To, be, to confess to you, I just, I just don't think about it. I believe it. But I'm, I feel kind of convicted that it's just like I'm not allowing that belief to have more influence on me. And I should. So pray for me on that. As I pray for you. So to bring this to an end today, to be taken seriously, we need discernment. We need to be wise. We don't need to be smarter. We need to be wiser. Paying attention to our times. And then dealing with spiritual, our own spiritual blindness sometimes. Not just paying attention to the times, but opening our eyes. Opening our eyes. We may say, it's like, well, what are the things we need to open our eyes to? Well, A, we need to open our eyes to see what God's doing. But the greatest thing to open our eyes to is like, oh, Lord, what are you doing in the lives of others? Lord, who are the, show me some unbelievers that you want me to talk to. Or do something, to do a good deed, to, to just say, hey, how are you doing? To connect with them. To go past our own blindness. Then, readiness for return. Every one of us, if I was to ask you, I know every one of you would want to be taken seriously. Matter of respect. That's part of who we should be as Christians, to respect one another. That's what boundaries are all about. But one of the areas of respect is, are we living out? Are we doing what we say? Are we looking like Jesus? And if I'm not, then I deserve no Christian respect. I need to be more respectable in that mindset. I need to be living as if this is the last day. We need to be doing that. We know. We know we have a world out there that says, oh, it's never going to end. You guys are idiots. That's the scoffing. There's no Jesus. There's no coming back. There's no end. This universe and everything, there's, it's just going to keep going on and on and on. That's what he said. That's what they said before Noah's flood. It's going to go on and on. You building that boat? Boy, that's the most doofus thing I've ever seen, building a giant boat. Never flooded before. I always love Jim Elliott. He said, I may be a fool for Christ, but whose fool are you? So yes, it may look foolish for us to believe that Jesus is coming back again, but I'm willing to be that fool. Of course, I, I have pretty good evidence he's going to come back again. Because last I checked, he rose from the grave. So he's alive and well. And he keeps his promises. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father God, we just thank you for that truth. And I just pray for our hearts, Lord. That, Lord, you would help us to consider that focus again, to consider and remember that we're in the last days. 
And every day is one day closer to you. One way or another. So Lord, I just pray that we would begin to order our lives that way. To look around and like, how am I living? Am I testifying to that truth? That my home is not here? That my home is in heaven? Am I living that out? So Father, help us. Show us where we can. And if we are, give us encouragement. Comfort us as, as we wait. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord one more time. Mm -hmm.